My name is Joel Levy. I'm the president of the Center for Jewish History, and I'd like to welcome everybody here this evening for a very, very special evening on this day. The center itself is a partnership of five different organizations, the American Sephardi Federation, the American Jewish Historical Society, the Leo Beck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and YIVO. All of these organizations have tremendous collections, the largest Jewish archive outside of the National Library in Israel of Jewish history. And we have in this building the collections that belong to the five partners, totaling more than 100 million documents, very large libraries and large numbers of objects. It is a study center for scholars from around the world who come here to do research, publish articles and books and so on. We also try to bring that history to life. And we like to think that to, in some sense, that history can be and should be and often is a current event. Tonight's program, which is a partnership specifically between the center itself and the American Jewish Historical Society, fits into that category. It is wonderful that we have all come together on this 30th yard site of Leon Klinghoffer, who was murdered 30 years ago today, and we're gathered this evening to talk about him and to talk about that life and so forth. It's, it's going to be a, uh, it has been a moving day actually uh, for Ilsa and Lisa, the daughters of Leon, who began early this morning. We had a program uh, with lawyers to take a look at some of the legal and other remedies and ways to deal with international terrorism. I had the privilege of meeting Lisa and Ilsa some years ago, just after 9-11, at which time I was at the Anti-Defamation League, and we had a terrorism expert from Israel who came here, and he wanted to go down into the pit of the World Trade Center, and we together all went down in a police uh, uh, Jeep that somehow they provided, and I can't remember whether either Ilsa or Lisa, one of them sat on my lap. I can't remember which one it was, <laughs> but it was a splendid beginning of a relationship now for the last 15 years, and uh, some months ago they suggested that they were ready to take the archive that they had accumulated all those years ago and over the years and to have it someplace where it would be accessible to the public and properly preserved and that eventually led to its coming here and uh, eventually to the program tonight. I would like to introduce my colleague, the Executive Director of the American Jewish Historical Society, Rachel Lithgow, who will actually introduce them. Rachel, please. Good evening and welcome. Uh, apologies for the snafu with the tickets. Ilsa and Lisa are very popular, what can I say? But thank you all for your patience and understanding and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Rachel Lithgow, I'm the director of the American Jewish Historical Society. It's a real pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, the American Jewish Historical Society is one of five partners here at the center, together with our friends at Leo Beck, Yeshiva University Museum, American Sephardi Federation, the Yivo Institute for Jewish Research, uh, we collect and archive and present the uniquely American story of uh, American Jewish history. That's what we do here at AJHS. Uh, we have collected the most important Jewish American organizations in history, including Hadassah, uh, the American Jewish Council and Congress, the Jewish Welfare Board, Machal Movement, the Hebrew Orphans Asylum, the archive of the American Soviet Jewry Movement, and I'm very proud to publicly announce for the first time as of last week, Thursday, Hyas. It, it, it was an exciting day, I confess. Uh, thank you. Uh, our archives encompass close to 30 million documents, photographs, artifacts, and ephemera from the 16th century to the present day. We are the future of the American Jewish past. Tonight we have an evening in two parts. I ask that you refer to your programs for full bios of our evening's participants, but let me set up what you're going to see. And after this very short setup, I'm going to introduce the man who made this evening possible, Jonathan Leader. Tonight, for the first time publicly, Ilsa and Lisa Klinghoffer will tell you how 30 years ago today, their lives were forever changed by a horrific event. 
They will share with you private recollections, memories of their parents and their own stories about the Achille Laurel hijacking and the events that followed. After they speak, I'll be back to introduce a truly blue ribbon panel. For the rest of the evening, our panel will talk about where history and historic events like the one we are commemorating this evening collide with culture in and around American society and what that means for artists and audiences. You will hear and see samples of how different mediums co-opt history to create art and hear directly from acclaimed artists about their processes for working in this very difficult arena. Our panel's moderator, Justin Davidson, will take questions you've already written on cards throughout the evening. There will be staff from the center collecting the cards uh, up and down the aisles throughout the evening. Please hand them off if you think you have a question for our panelists or for Ilsa and Lisa later. Uh, after the program, we invite you to join us in the Steinberg Great Hall for a reception. And finally, before I introduce uh, Jonathan and before Ilsa and Lisa take the stage, I want to thank my friends and colleagues at the Center for Jewish History, especially Joel Levy, uh, whose long and personal relationship with which he just shared a bit, uh, with Ilsa and Lisa uh, led to tonight's very special event. And I want to thank my staff and the Center for Jewish History staff for really pulling together and working so hard for tonight. Um, the establishment of the Klinghoffer Archive at the American Jewish Historical Society, which comprises letters, poems, songs, articles, photographs, and all the important papers associated with the hijacking of the Achille Loro and the murder of Land Klinghoffer will allow future generations to study and research this important historical event. Supporting our archives and collections is paramount for this reason. If you haven't already looked at archival material in the Great Hall from the Klinghoffer Collection, please don't leave without seeing firsthand what we can do here at the center. As hard as I know it was for Ilza and Lisa to part with these materials, I want to publicly let them know they will be respected and well cared for. We at AJHS, like Ilza and Lisa, are committed to telling this story to making material available and to shining a spotlight on this event in history. The murder of Leon Klinghoffer made it clear that terrorism can strike at anyone. I promise you, Ilsa and Lisa, I know you can hear me in there. Uh, we will make this story, oh, they're right in front of me. I'm embarrassed. I promise you that we will make this story known to future generations in memory of your parents, Leon and Marilyn Klinghoffer, my dear friends. I'm going to introduce uh, the sponsor for this evening's event, Jonathan Leader, and then we'll present a very short film, and then Ilsa and Lisa will take the stage. Jonathan, please. So first of all, Joel, you and I have known each other a long time. You've never asked me to sit on your lap. <laughs> I, I, I think looking at the crowd, tonight's ticket was probably hotter than the Yankees-Houston uh, game. <laughs> but I can guarantee the outcome tonight will be a lot better than the other night. Uh, my wife, Dina, who's sitting in the audience and I are delighted to support the Center for Jewish History and its partner for this evening's program, the American Jewish Historical Society. Under the center's new leadership of our longtime friend, Joel Levy, and our new friend at the American Jewish Historical Society, Rachel Lithgow, the Center for Jewish History has become a cultural destination for outstanding Jewish programming. In addition, of course, the center con uh, continues to fill its traditional role as a world-class resource for Jewish documents and artifacts. Tonight's program commemorating and honoring, honoring the mur murder of Leon Klinghoffer illustrates that 15 West 16th Street, and I'll say that address again, 15 West 16th Street, is a dynamic place for multi-dimensional celebrations of Jewish history, including popular culture, and narrative in all forms, as Rachel pointed out, from film to music to storytelling and journalism. All of this, of course, is based on the infinite inventory of primary source material housed in the center's parts, constituent parts. In sum, 
Dina and I feel that there is no place in New York that offers such a multiple lens approach to history, where yesterday's documents become the source material for exciting multimedia presentations like tonight. Tonight's program is sold out, so stay tuned for the center's future events so that you will be part of the excitement. Tonight's evening is going to be emotional, inspirational, and incredibly interesting. So what do we say now? On with the show. Thank you. The Achille Lauro is the latest target of international terrorism, seized in the Mediterranean Sea like the piracy of earlier centuries, but with nothing romantic about this chilling affair. These are some of the lucky passengers. A total of almost 750, including about 80 Americans, were on the cruise from Italy to Egypt, scheduled to go on to Israel, Cyprus, and Greece. These passengers got off in Egypt for some touring. That left 119 on board with over 300 crew members. A rescue mission would be dangerous but possible. British commandos parachuted onto the Queen Elizabeth II in 1972 when there was a bomb scare in the middle of the Atlantic. Perhaps 12 Palestinian pirates seized the Achille Lauro. From News Center 7, tonight's news break is brought to you by Kroger. Good evening, I'm Jim Baldridge. French and Italian warships are reportedly shadowing that Italian cruise ship hijacked by Palestinian terrorists. 420 persons are aboard. One unconfirmed report says two Americans have been killed. The murder of a 69-year-old disabled passenger from New York City angers America. After a 72-hour siege at sea, Negotiations among the PLO, Italy, and Egypt succeed in getting the Achille Lauro back to Egypt. There, the four terrorists surrender the ship. At first, the world is led to believe that no one is harmed, so the Palestinians are promised safe passage out of Egypt. But the next day, the truth is learned, and the U.S. ambassador to Egypt makes the announcement. The murder of a 69-year-old disabled passenger from New York City angers America. Americans are outraged when the terrorists are allowed to escape on an Egyptian plane to safe territory in Tunisia. This time, Reagan takes action. What we want is justice done. In a flawless execution, U.S. Navy F-14 fighter jets intercept the Egyptian airliner in midair and force it to land at a U.S. base in Sicily. These young Americans sent a message to terrorists everywhere. A message you can run, but you can't hide. Italian courts convict the Palestinian hijackers. But again, the Reagan administration and the public are left dismayed when Italian authorities grant freedom to Abu al-Abbas the man believed to be the brains behind the hijacking. Italian courts had found no direct evidence of his involvement. Terrorists, hostages, demands. Anybody who tries to stop us will be killed. The civilized world was fed up. America was ready. Force them down, now. They tried to run. They couldn't hide. A world premiere event based on the actual incident. Filmed where it actually happened. No. Voyage of Terror. The Voyage begins Tuesday at 8 on Channel 11. Yes, Colonel, I think we've got the break we've been looking for. We've intercepted a conversation from Cairo between the Egyptian foreign minister and one of his aides. The four Achille Lauro hijackers and their leader, Abu Abbas, are still in Egyptian territory, despite official declarations of the contrary. They're leaving Cairo at 2200 hours tonight, local time, on an Egypt Air common carrier passenger plane. General Davies is on the line, Mr. President. 
We've just gotten the final confirmation we've been waiting for. The aircraft left Cairo, and the murderers are on board. Get them. son's school in a PTA meeting and uh, a good friend of mine came running up to me and said did you hear the news they got him they got him and I said they got Saddam she said no I Ben Loudon no she said they got a boss <laughs> I don't want to see that happen <laughs> I mean I think this is the moment to take a stand and make it, you know, this, is, this isn't just personal. I mean, it's personal for our family, but there's a broader picture here. It's terrorism, and it's staring us all in the face every day of the week, every hour of the day. And I think the toughest, the toughest sentence that he can get in this country would make us feel that some kind of justice has been, uh, has happened. And furthermore, all of these years and before the death of our father, he has been he has been training terrorists, he's been funneling money to different countries to help with the training, to help out families whose children um, or, or any family member suicide commit suicide bombings. So, I mean, in the bigger scheme, to have him put in a place, a secure place for the rest of his life, will save umpteen number of lives going forward. I, I also wanted to add that, yes, I do think that our father's murder was kind of a milestone in the whole era of terrorism. And at that point, it was sort of an alert, definitely to Americans, that doesn't matter where you are, that you can be a victim. And we don't want him to just to slip through the cracks again. Uh, a lot has happened in the world in 17 years, and this time we want, this time we would like to see justice, not politics, justice. I remember him, and I remember so many wonderful things, and I also feel very lucky that I had him up to a certain age, because I know that other people lost their parents at a younger age. I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. It means so much to us. And my sister and I are just so grateful for you to be here. We want to tell you a little bit about our family, our father, maybe something that you didn't know already. And right off the bat, our father was a hard worker. And that's putting it mildly. If he wasn't at the store, he was at the factory. If he wasn't at the factory, he was home tinkering and fixing and creating. Here's a fun fact, which you, I saw they showed some pictures. In the 50s, our father invented the rotobroil with his brother. It was the first of its kind. It was a rotisserie oven that sat on the kitchen counter. Everybody had them. And you can learn more about it by looking at the Mr. and Mrs. Rotobroil cookbook outside in the display. <laughs> it's not good for your cholesterol. No. <laughs> the Klinghoffer family lived on the Lower East Side. There were three sisters and two brothers. They had Klinghoffer Supply Company on Avenue A and 4th Street, and they sold absolutely every kind of hardware you could possibly need. And we were lucky because we got our first jobs sorting nails, <laughs> putting 
stocking the shelves, shoveling snow, whatever they want us, wanted us to do, we did. It was our first jobs, and we were so grateful. And another thing is that our father wanted to try to help whoever he could, and if you came into the store and you didn't have enough money to pay for the, the, the item, he'd say, ah, just take it, you'll pay me later. Remember the story when our father was rushing with our mother, she was going into labor to give birth to me? They left the building, started to leave the building, and a friend, a neighbor, said, Leon, I need you just for one minute. My <laughs> lock is broken. I know it'll just take a second. He turned to our mother, he said, sit down and don't move. How could, <laughs> how could she move? She was in labor. <laughs> Well, he fixed the locks, they got to the hospital, and the rest is history because I'm here. <laughs> but, but, they hope for a boy, and we always say how sad it is because now they have two beautiful grandsons, Max and Michael, whom they would have adored. They would have loved them. Our mother was also a really hard worker. She worked at Grala Publications, and she was in human resources. She put in a full day of work. She'd come home, we'd have dinner, and she was back on the phone conducting interviews that she couldn't complete during the day, working all the time. But what was really incredible were the letters that she received from the people she didn't even hire. It was amazing. She'd get the letters that say, Thank you so much for your guidance, your counsel. It was such valuable news for me. That was our mother. She was incredibly special. <clears throat> they were both workaholics, that's for sure, but family came first, always. And we had a tradition every Friday night, we had a Shabbat dinner, and it was something we could count on and every week my mother would cook a beautiful dinner. When I say cook, I mean assemble. <laughs> because she didn't cook. We don't cook. <laughs> so Klinghoffers just don't cook. <laughs> but we had a wonderful dinner, and it, it was times that we'll always remember. But Saturday night, that was their night. They got all dolled up. And they went out no matter what. It was, they were so glamorous, we couldn't stop looking at them. Um, after our father had a second stroke, our mother was committed to doing everything she could to keep life as normal as possible for them. Even to the point when she herself was diagnosed at age 57 with aggressive colon cancer, she refused any treatment that would keep her away from our father, even for a single night. Our parents were unbeatable hosts. They had parties, celebrations, because my mother's mantra was, you have to celebrate the happy times, because in life, there certainly are enough unhappy ones. And they certainly did. They had parties, they invited everybody, and even at the last minute, uh, if, if a person had, didn't have a place to go, a friend of mine or my sister's, they'd say, bring them in. And if they didn't have enough food, my mother would walk around and say, FHB, which meant family hold back. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and she always had enough food. In 1974, a wonderful thing happened they discovered the Jersey Shore. Every weekend, rain or shine, or snow or sleet, they went to Long Branch. It was wonderful, and that's where they made a group of lifelong friendships. They did everything together. They dined out, they had parties, they traveled together. Many of their, we, we would call this group of people the beach people and many of their children are here tonight. And you know what we call them? We call them the beach people, the sequel. <laughs> we'll just put it under here. Yes, 
Our parents, by the way, did everything with them, including traveling. And in 1970, <laughs> in the summer of 1985, they organized, they put together a Mediterranean cruise with the beach people. They were going to go on this wonderful trip. They were so excited. They planned it down to the end. I remember sitting around the dining room table together, going over the whole itinerary, everything that they were going to do. My mother even called the travel company to find out how big the doorways were so that the wheelchair could go through. She wanted it to be perfect. She didn't want anything to go wrong, something that they would always remember. Day of the trip, we ran to the apartment to say goodbye, and the car was in the driveway. My father had just run in from work, because I God forbid he not work, the day he was going on the trip, and he was talking to the doorman, their doorman, whose name was Israel. And he said, Israel, please take care of my, my daughters while, while we're away. And Israel said, don't you worry, Mr. Klinghoffer, I'm going to take real good care of them. And the car sped away, and that was the last time I saw my father. It was October 7th, 1985, and I was coming home from work, stopped in a Korean deli to pick up some dinner, and there was a radio on, and a bulletin came over the radio. The bulletin said, there's been a hijacking of a cruise ship in the Mediterranean. The name of the boat is the Achille Loro. I dropped everything. I ran home. I pulled out the itinerary. It was a match. That was the ship our parents were on. I was in shock. I, I just couldn't imagine what this meant. I called my sister immediately. And I was in my studio that afternoon. I'm a painter. That's where I am all the time. And I didn't have the news on. And so I hadn't heard what had happened. And I went trudging home, as always, to find 100 messages on my answering machine. Lisa, call home. Lisa, call home. Lisa, call home. I thought, oh my god, this is going to be terrible news. Something's happened to mommy. Something's happened to daddy. They got ill. That's what I was expecting to hear. I knew it wasn't going to be good news. So I got my sister on the line, and I'm waiting to hear this news. But instead, she says, Lisa, it's the boat. It's the boat, the ship. She just kept saying, it's the ship. It's the ship. And I said, the ship? Well, what about the ship? And she said, the ship, the Achille Laurel has been hijacked. I just saw stars. I don't know, didn't know what that, I, I just didn't know what that meant. I don't even remember even hearing that word ever, like maybe in a movie. She said, stay where you are. Don't move. I was frozen. She said, someone is coming to get you. Shortly after, my husband Jerry came and got me to take me over to my parents' apartment. When we arrived there, the the building was surrounded by media, the photographers, journalists, trucks, sound trucks, everything, po everything. It was, it was pandemonium, and they were screaming out, Lisa, Lisa, could you tell us, uh, how are your parents? How's Marilyn? How's Lisa? How's Leon? I, first of all, I, I didn't know anything, and then how did they even know who I was? How did they know my name? It was mind-boggling. We scurried up to the apartment to find utter chaos. It was like a headquarters. There were people manning the phones. There were people running around. Friends and relatives had started to come to, to be helpful. And we were so lucky that we had good people around us, friends. We had a doctor. We had a, a lawyer. And we had a special friend, Letty Simon, who helped us navigate through this maze that I mean, we didn't know how to do any of this. And so we decided to, we went down to the media every, to the media every couple of hours 
to tell them what it, we, it, if we had any information, and we got information from them as well. And so we established a, a nice relationship to the point where I think they really <laughs> bonded with us and really hoped that, that things would be turning out okay. We still actually, though, didn't know who actually was on the ship. Uh, we, we were still hoping that our parents at the last minute had decided to take the trip. But in our hearts, what, you know, we, we knew yeah. they were on the, we knew it was them. And shortly thereafter, uh, we got the call from the State Department telling us that it was them. One of the things we were told was that if we spoke publicly, the hijackers might show some compassion. So let this good friend Letty of ours set up a whirlwind, go to half a dozen news programs and tell our story. We were in the car, out of the car, hair, makeup, on air, back in the car, out of the car, next one, next one. We just Push through it. We didn't even have time to be nervous, like tonight. <laughs> Which is probably a good thing. We just pushed through and did that whole thing. And what was so wonderful was that everybody at the news stations were rooting for us. They were just so nice and praying for a good outcome. So this was followed by two excruciating days waiting for any piece of news that we could get. You, you just can't imagine how anxious we were. We just couldn't imagine what was going on. Finally, we received the call from the State Department. The hijacking was over. They told us no one was hurt. Oh my gosh, we were, we had a lift, we were started a party, we had Pop champagne. Open the champagne, it was a great old party. It was, we couldn't imagine what the stories would be that our parents were going to tell us. I mean, this is the way it should end, they're happy, right? Not long after that, though, people started to leave the apartment. And we couldn't understand why. They weren't even saying goodbye. They didn't say goodbye to us. I mean, our friends showed or they just left. And then the televisions were being turned off. We couldn't understand. That's how we were getting our news. And I saw my sister have an altercation with my fiance over that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how could he keep turning? That's how we were getting our news. So then Jerry, my brother-in-law, took my sister into one room in the apartment. And Paul, my fiance, took me into another room. They told us they had received a confirming call from the State Department that one passenger was killed, and it was our father. We were devastated. We were inconsolable. How could this happen to a defenseless man in a wheelchair? Who would do that to somebody? and Ilsa and no no she's Yoni okay okay yeah. Can, okay I'm Sarah Reimer I was the New York Times reporter who was with Ilsa and Lisa and their family I'm, I'm more used to writing than talking, so let me know if you can't hear me, <laughs> on, that, on that awful day. And I was, uh, I had been at the Times maybe one or two years. I was a general assignment reporter on the city desk, and that means every day, you know, they just throw something at you. So the day before, somebody had said, go down to this apartment on East 10th Street. The, something's, the ship's been hijacked. The, the, their father is on the ship. So... I ran down there, and there was a press conference outside the apartment, and afterward, Letty Simon, their family friend, came up to me and said, why don't you come upstairs? And that is when I began to learn about the power of the New York Times. But <laughs> as soon as I got into the apartment and met Ilsa and Lisa 
and Jerry and Paul, I just, I immediately um, related to them. And, I, and I, I think so many people did. I just connected with them. Um, my parents had a great marriage. They were a little bit younger. I have sisters. And um, it, sort, it sort of seemed like things were going to work out. So I, and they told me all about their parents and the beach people. They did not tell me about the roto-broiler, which is <laughs> a detail a reporter would kill for. So the first day's story was, you know, just this, that they were part of this group, the beach people and the family and how close they were and how close the parents were. And it ran on the front page, and I, I think people just kind of fell in love with the Klinghoffers. And um, so then the next day, I went back, and um, it just, you know, it seemed like this is going to be a great, st a, a happy story, a celebration. I remember the champagne. I think I remember you raising the glasses. I remember that they were such a wonderful family that they, they I think they insisted that I have a glass of champagne. And, you know, you're a reporter. You're supposed to be in the background. And, um, you know, I was probably thinking, how much do I need before I can file this great, happy story? And then I remember Jerry and Paul made sort of something was happening and I think one of you came over to me and said we got this terrible news I remember them taking Ilsa and Lisa into the bedrooms and I, I wasn't going to say this part but I, I mentioned it to them and I think Lisa said say this I just I, I I've never heard the sound of that kind of grief before or since it, it was terrible it was so heartbreaking and um, I I, and I really wanted to leave. I felt I should not be here. This is, a, this is an invasion of the most private kind of grief and suffering. And, you know, we didn't have cell phones there, so I, I, I must have gone into another room and called the deputy foreign editor, and I think I said, I, I really think I should leave. And, of course, he said, you should stay. <laughs> but then the family, to my astonishment, made it very clear that they, they wanted me there. I mean, they, they, they wanted a witness. And so... I stayed, and I remember the, the, the apartment just filling up as the hours went on with these amazing friends, the beach people, relatives, and I don't usually read from my own stories, but there were, there were two quotes when I read this over that just seemed like they embody this family. So the grandmother, Rose Kane, Marilyn's mother, and she was just, uh, to me, the epitome of, of grace and stoicism. She'd been through it all. And she went into the bedrooms and spoke to Lisa and Ilsa, who I, they never came out again that day. And she came out and she said, I'm strong. You know how you get strong? You meet each situation as it comes. Over a lifetime, all these situations add up, one after the other, and then you're strong and old. And then um, a cousin... Sussy Weiss said something else that just seems so true of them. There was so much happiness and so much sorrow in this apartment, said Sussy Weiss, a cousin of Marilyn Klinghoffer. So many good times. When they gave a party, they gave a party. And when they made friends, they made them for life. And, and just seeing them and their family and their sons and talking with them, it, 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 it just seems never more true than it is today. So thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. So we were told uh, that our mother would be calling us from, from Egypt off the boat to personally tell us what had happened. And of course we knew already. So shortly at, thereafter we get the call, our mother's on the other line, and she says, girls, girls, I have something I have to tell you. And then there, she just couldn't... I guess she just couldn't find the words. How do you tell us this? And we knew that, so we tried to make it easy for her and we, easier for her, and we said, Mom, we know. And she said, you know? How could you know? What do you know? I said, Mom, we know. And she said, you can't, you, I said, Mom, we know that we know about Daddy. There was a long pause. She took a breath and she said, okay, girls, your father was a hero. Do your crying now because I've done mine. And when I come home, we have a lot of work to do. 
We got our orders. And, by the way, could you do me a favor and call my boss, Milk Brawler, and tell him that I'm not going to be into work for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, Mom, Milt is standing right next to me. You can tell him yourself. <laughs> Milt is there. How does Milt know? <laughs> what do you mean, Milt's there? And I said, Mom, every, how does he know? I said, Mom, everybody knows. She just had no idea. I said, the world knows what happened to Daddy. When our mother returned home, she was so weak and ill, and she could barely stand up. But somehow, she summoned the strength to come out, perch herself on this blue velvet couch that we had. She reclined there in a satin robe. I can remember this so vividly. And she met people who wanted to come and pay a visit, make a condolence call. She summoned some kind of inner strength to meet with them. Afterwards, she collapsed with exhaustion. We were astonished at how she did this in her condition. We really never asked her how she did it. We just watched and saw her, saw, we just saw how she did it. You know, every time the bell would ring, we never know, knew who would be on the other side. There was Simon Wiesenthal, there was Bibi Netanyahu, there was Mayor Koch. It went like that for days. They wanted to talk, to hear the story. My mother told it over and over and over again. She even met with President and Nancy Reagan. She met them at the Waldorf Astoria. I remember she put on her best suit. She looked so regal. She was stunning, simply stunning. She spoke with such clarity and conviction that the Reagans were totally moved and stunned by her story. And this is her story. The ship was docked in Alexandria. The terrorists, the four terrorists, were cleaning their rifles, their guns, in their stateroom. They got on the ship because they had fake passports, and in those days, nobody checked. So they just walked right on, and, and they took the cruise. They were cruising around. They probably were sitting at the next table. They sort of looked a little out of place, but there they were. So when they were discovered cleaning their, their guns, well, actually, their original mission, the reason they were on the boat, was to the plan, the original plan was to take the cruise to Israel, blow up the port in Israel, and kill as many Israelis, as many people as they could. But when they were discovered, they had to change their plan. Our parents were sitting in the dining room having a nice leisurely lunch. It was a beautiful thing. When suddenly, without warning, the four terrorists ran into the room, brandishing their rifles, shooting up the place, Shooting, on, shooting at the ceiling, the curtains, everything, screaming, Arafat, yes, Reagan, no. Arafat, good, Reagan, bad, over and over and over again. Meanwhile, our friend Sylvia Sherman, who was an artist, was quietly sitting in her, in her chair, I mean, I don't know how she did this, sketching the terrorists. I mean, can you imagine that? And it was on a menu. On the menu. <laughs> she took the menu and because she, I guess she had the presence of mind to think that perhaps these could be used to identify the terrorists at, po at some point, and they were. And we actually have them here today upstairs. We got them from the FBI, and they're just amazing. They look like the terrorists. So, in continu continuation, 
they separated the Jewish Americans from the others. And they started moving them through the boat. My mother was holding on to the chair, gripping my father's chair, trying to keep up, pushing him forward. I mean, she wasn't that strong, but she had to keep moving. She had to keep pushing. When they got to the stairs to go to up the deck, they wanted them to go to the top deck. I mean, how was she going to do that? So one of the terrorists sh tapped her on the shoulder and said, you stay, we'll take care of him, pointing to my father. But how could she do that? How could she leave? How could she leave Leon? She never left Leon. She looked back at him and he looked at her, but she had no choice. They pushed her up the steps and they wheeled my father away. And I'm sure I'm not sure if anybody knows this, but when they took the hostages up to the deck, they tortured them. They hit them with their guns over the head over the feet, they laid in the sun for hours, and then they played these mind games with, with uh, loaded hand grenades where they would go up to them and pretend like they were gonna pull them as if to say, at any moment we can kill you. Can you imagine that? And we learned later that the reason that they killed our father, the, real, the reason was because they wanted the world to know that they had no mercy. After the hijacking was over, our mother frantically tore through the ship, searching for our father. She was directed to the captain's quarters. Captain DeRosa ushered her in. He said, Mrs. Klinghoffer, there was one fatality and it was Mr. Klinghoffer. He was shot, thrown overboard with the wheelchair. He said to her, I am so sorry. He went on to say, in order to end the hijacking, I had to tell the State Department that everybody was safe. President Reagan heard what had happened, he was furious. He said, not on my watch. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Larry Neal, Commander Larry Neal, U.S. Navy retired. I'm so honored that I've been invited here tonight to be part of this whole event. But please realize that I am representing many sailors and airmen that participated in the events of October 1985. I've been asked to say a few words about the intercept mission in October of 80, I'm sorry, October 10th. But tonight is not about that mission, so my remarks will be a little bit brief. At that time, I was serving as an F-14 pilot attached to VF-103 aboard the USS Saratoga, which was at that point deploy deployed to the Mediterranean. On the evening of October 10th, the Saratoga was steaming north towards Dubrovnik. The ship was in a very low alert status. The aircraft had been disarmed. They were all tied down. Uh, we were pretty much just sitting around watching TV, which we did sometimes. The night was moonless, dark, very dark, and exceptionally clear. At 7 p.m., with absolutely no warning, there was a frantic call to launch four alert F-14s an alert E-2 radar aircraft, and the alert tankers. 20 minutes later, we had aircraft in the air, which from a standing start is pretty, pretty impressive and speaks volumes to the men and women that man our flight decks on the aircraft carriers. There was no briefing of any kind. Just before I closed my canopy, a friend climbed up the side of the aircraft and told me, Larry, you're looking for a civilian airliner, and you may be cleared to fire. I stopped him and I said, say that again, very slowly. He said the same way. Some moments from that night, I don't want to take up much time. There were several lights out intercepts on lights out aircraft, pitch black. 
to the point that there were actually handheld flashlights used to identify the unknown aircraft from a very, very close range in the dark. There was an intercept of a Libyan F uh, MiG-23 out of Benina. Got into about 35 miles, and then he was changed his mind and went home. One crew got so close to the Egypt Air 737 that they could see the pink outfits of the flight attendants on board the aircraft. Eventually, we surrounded the 737 with four lights out F-14s. When the 737 pilot refused to comply with the E-2's directions to proceed to Siganella on the island of Sicily, we turned our lights on. He decided to comply. We escorted the 737 to Siganella, where it landed on its third attempt. As it rolled out, out of nowhere appeared two C-141s whose lights came back on and came to a stop behind the 737, effectively preventing it from trying to escape. Aboard those 141s, as we found out later, we didn't know at the time, was SEAL Team 6. None of the F-14s that took, uh, took part in this mission ever landed in Siganella and all returned safely to Saratoga. Next. We didn't learn of the mission's purpose or its outcome until after landing back on Saratoga. Ship turned north, and we were in Dubrovnik a couple days later, wearing sunglasses and being told to avoid the press. So those are a few moments from that evening in October of 1985. And it was a, a pretty important mission in my life. And it was a mission that, as I look back on it, very few units or very few organizations other than naval aviation could have done successfully. So again, I want to thank you for having me here tonight. I appreciate it. And, uh, and good night to you all. rest of the group, the beach people, were brought home by army transport. She was asked if she would be up to identifying the hijackers en route to New York. And she said, absolutely. You, murderer. You, murderer! You, murderer! You, murderer! After she identified each hijacker, she spat in each one of their faces. And then a miracle of sorts happened. Our father's body washed up on the shores in Syria, and Syria sent him back to us. And we were so grateful that we could have a body, to, that we could have, we could bury him, have a funeral, and sit Shiva. On October 21st, 1985, we had the funeral for our father. It was attended by thousands of people. It was that day that I learned something very special. Our father's very close, dearest childhood friend, Charlotte Spiegel, gave one of the eulogies. And what she said was, Leon had confided in her. She said that he had been practicing walking with his therapist, and he wanted to surprise me on my wedding day to walk me down the aisle. When Marilyn came, when our mother came home, she, she was a hell on wheels. There was no stopping her. She was determined that she was going to educate people and she was going to make every person involved in our father's murder become accountable. She was sick, 
She was frail, getting sicker every day, but she couldn't turn down an invitation from Congress to speak in front of Congress. So we drove down to DC. She slept all the way down in the car. We practically had to pick her up and bring her into the, into, the, into the building. But then when she got into the building, she somehow transformed. And she, she picked herself up. She rose regally like she always did. And she gave the speech of her life and you could have heard a pin drop. Hi, uh, my name is Max Klinghoffer Dwarren. I'm Ilsa's son. Uh, that's Ilsa. Um, and this is my cousin Michael, Leon Klinghoffer Arbiter, and it's Lisa's son. Uh, and we're going to read excerpts uh, from our grandmother, Marilyn. Sorry, one sec. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, we're going to read excerpts from our grandmother Marilyn's testimony uh, before the U.S. Congress on October 30th, 1985. Uh, but I'm going to go off script for one second uh, before we do that. And just on behalf of uh, me and, and my cousin, I just I want to say we don't say it enough, but but you two and, and, and this story has just inspired us throughout our lives. Uh, and, and it's just incredible that you're telling it like this because I've never heard you say it like this. And I know how 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 um, hard it is for you to, to relive this and, and just, and it's so great to, to, to hear and, and, and you're just an inspiration to all of us. Um, and in, in addition, I know there are a lot of people here who are, as you've heard, who are friends and family and, and who knew all of us at that time. Uh, we, we were not in the picture, but um, <laughs> who knew everybody else at, at that time and, and, and your, um, dedication to, to our family and, and, and your strength uh, really carried us through. And, and so for all of you who are here and those of you, uh, those who have already passed away, uh, just thank you so much uh, for that. It means the world. So uh, here, so pardon me for going off script. Uh, here are some excerpts uh, from our grandmother Marilyn's testimony uh, before the United States Congress, again, on October 30th, 1985. The purpose of my appearance before you today is to make clear my conviction that terrorism constitutes the gravest danger confronting the civilized world. We all live on the front lines of this battlefield, for that is precisely what it is, an undeclared war in which we are all combatants. Think back over the past two years. This, I'm going off script. Remember, this is 1985. Think back over the past two years. Think about where terrorism has been targeting its victims, on airplanes, at airports, in villages, on beaches, in restaurants, and finally, in the least likely place of all, on a peaceful cruise ship in the middle of sea. And the victims have not been confined to members of the military forces. On the contrary, most of them were innocent civilians maimed or killed because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Each person sitting in this room, each member of this committee, each member of this Congress, and all of your constituents are potential victims unless we enlist in a worldwide crusade to eradicate terrorism from our midst. I join in asking you to foster universal acceptance by all nations of the concept that terrorism is ultimate crime against humanity. For is it only through the firm resolve of all nations to act in concert that it will become impossible for terrorists to find safe haven anywhere in the world. These people must be known that once having committed an act of terrorism, there's no place for them to go, no place for them to run, no place for them to hide. Terrorism can function only under the protection of nations hostile to human values and world peace. I believe that my husband's death has made a difference in the way that people now perceive their vulnerability. I believe that what happened to the passengers on the Achille Laura and to my family had to happen, can happen to anyone at any time, at any place. For the first time in memory, there appears to be a manifestation of outrage so universal that it speaks to many tongues. They cry out for action. I believe that people, 
that people of goodwill, not only in the country, not only in this country, but also all over the world, are ready to close ranks, become soldiers, and battle against terrorism. My cousin and I are so grateful to be here to honor our grandfather and our grandmother, and hopefully one day world terrorism can come to an end. Thank you. Well, we weren't prepared for what came next. One evening, over dinner, our mother made an announcement. She said, girls, I have something to tell you. She said, I am suing the PLO. She said, nothing will change my mind. You are either with me or you're not, and I'm hoping you're with me. Well, we, we were petrified. <laughs> we were terrified. She said, this is something that I must do for your father. We knew she was determined. She pushed herself back from the table and she walked out of the room. Lisa and I just looked at each other. <laughs> but we knew and, and we came to understand and we are so proud of our mother for what she did. Um, her courage, this is something that had never been done before. Her lawsuit set precedent for suing a terrorist organization or a foreign government that was involved in any acts of ter terrorism against American citizens. Sadly, three months later, our mother died. That was just four months after the hijacking and six weeks before my wedding day. So we had a choice to make. We could either hide under the covers, sit in the closet, suck our thumbs, to feel woe is me, why did this happen to us, feel sorry for ourselves, which we did a little, <laughs> or we could continue the important work that our mother started. There really wasn't a choice. I mean, we knew exactly what we had to do. Mar our mother, Marilyn's mission became our mission. To put a face on terrorism so that it wasn't this abstract idea. It happened it could happen to anyone. It could happen anywhere at any time to a family just like ours. Right now, I have to thank two few special people. I want to thank the Grala family for starting the Leon Klinghoffer Memorial Foundation. And we would also like to thank so lovingly Abe Foxman, and our entire ADL family, some of whom are here today with us, in creating the Leon and Marilyn Klinghoffer Memorial Foundation of the Anti-Defamation League. Long word. But we couldn't do this work without them. We've been active in the battle against terrorism for 30 years. And what has meant most to us has been working with law enforcement to bring those responsible for the hijacking of the Achilles Loro and the murder of our father to justice. You can imagine the great satisfaction we had for a few years ago when we watched in a Manhattan courtroom the conviction of a notorious arms dealer, Mansur al Qasar convicted for selling arms to be used against Americans, including the arms that killed our father. He never thought he'd get convicted. We stared him down. We thought, finally, some justice has been served. When he got convicted, he turned around and looked at us. He knew who we were, and we, as my sister said, we just stared him down. 
our government, which pursued this case for years and continues to pursue these kinds of cases, never forgot. And we can't thank them enough, excuse me, we can't thank them enough for what they've done. In fact, tonight, we have two attorneys from the Southern District Office who were the trial lawyers on the case of Mansur al Kassar, Boyd, uh, Boyd Johnson and Brendan McGuire, who we thank from the bottom of our hearts. God, Tim, get up, please. Coming to a close, <laughs> we also just want to give special thanks to Sarah Reimer and Larry Neal for sharing their stories this evening. Jennifer Levy, <laughs> Jennifer Levy and Heather Cartwright are here also today from the Department of Justice. We thank you for your support. <laughs> we thank all four of you for traveling to be with us this evening. We also want to thank Joel and Rachel and the Leader Family Foundation for supporting this evening and for your support of the Klinghoffer Archive. It means so much to us. It's so comforting to know that all of these documents and materials will be safely preserved here for future study. And we can walk over and visit them. <laughs> And finally, we want to recognize our husbands, Paul and Jerry, and our sons, Max and Michael, for always being there for us. And lastly, and lastly we just want to thank all of you for your continued support. And I want to thank my sister. I knew this was going to happen. And I want to thank my sister. Thank you. We're going to go down there. Sister Water. Now, uh, for the second part of our evening, I would like to welcome our panel to the stage. I'm first, I'm, I'm only going to introduce our moderator. Um, our moderator for this evening is Justin Davidson. He is the architecture and classical music critic for New York Magazine. He's been in that role since 2007, is that right? Um, he won the Pulitzer for Criticism in 2002. Uh, he is a wonderful moderator, and I think this panel is really going to bring home some of the narrative that you heard tonight, and uh, I'm happy to introduce this panel to talk about where culture and history collide. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful recitation of uh, these historical events. And of course, this is a historical society, which means that it collects documents and experiences that help explain and help us understand what happened, what actually happened. Not a fantasy, not an agenda-driven interpretation, but a chronicle like the one we just heard that comes as close as possible to the objective truth. Uh, that's why you heard Ilsa and Lisa recite their own experiences of a terrible historical moment. And they did it beautifully. Um, and it matters that they did it beautifully. It matters that they really put so much of themselves, not just into the fight that they have been conducting for 30 years, but into the preparations and the delivery of that story this evening. Because what you heard was also a performance. It's the story that they experienced, repeated over the years to each other, to friends, to family, to the news media, refined in recent weeks, 
edited, prepared for delivery to an audience. And it really matters to your experience, to what you take away from this evening and to what the world takes away about what happened, how these things are delivered. So they turn those memories, those experiences into something else, something new, um, a kind of performance art, really. So I don't mean when I say that to question a syllable of what they actually said, but I do want to point out that the thread, the line between history and art is very slender. And sometimes we don't even know when we've crossed it. So in a few minutes, we're going to talk about what happens when we cross that line intentionally. What happens when creative people uh, gather real events, uh, real experiences that happen to others, and treat them as raw material, the way Lisa and Ilsa did for their own stories tonight? What happens when I narrate your life, when I make your story my own? That happens all the time in ways that we don't even really appreciate when it happens. It seems to me that anybody who tells a contemporary story, uh, either in an informal setting or in a formal one, whether it's a composer, a director, a writer, or a journalist, necessarily takes ownership of that story. It becomes that person's project. So the question is, what responsibility does the creative person have to the subject? Uh, the photographer Sally Mann uh, recently published a memoir named, uh, called Hold Still. And you, remember, you may remember, even if you haven't read, the wonderful book about photography. She's a very um, interesting photographer. And you may remember some years ago, she was in the news and very controversial because she had taken some uh, nude and intimate pictures of her young children at the time, take, gotten a lot of flack for that. Uh, so in the 90s, she was criticized for exploiting young children, her young children. And she points out in the book, she pointed out then and does so in the book, that the kids knew exactly what she was doing. They understood what, her mother, what their mother was doing. They understood that they were participating in an art project, and they participated eagerly. But she also writes in the same book about the experience of taking a photograph of a person, a portrait, which is another way of telling somebody else's story. She writes, the photographer holds all the cards. We always do. Exploitation lies at the root of every great, great portrait, and all of us know it. Is that true? Even the simplest picture of another person is ethically complex. And the ambitious photographer, no matter how sincere, is compromised right from the get-go. That sentiment, when I read it, resonated uh, for me with something that uh, Janet Malcolm uh, wrote about reporting. Uh, it's a cruel but probably accurate statement. She writes, this is Janet Malcolm now, Every journalist who is not too stupid or full of himself to notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indefensible. He's a kind of confidence man, preying on people's vanity, ignorance, or loneliness, gaining their trust and betraying them without remorse. As a journalist, I have to say that stings, but I recognize the ethical delicacy of asking people questions on the implicit assumption that you are there to tell their story in the way they want it told. You are their mirror. I have done countless profiles of people who were sure, despite a lifetime in public spent talking to journalists, that we were partners in a project. I was helping them deliver a message that they wanted delivered. And it was very interesting to hear Sarah Reimer talk about being in that apartment at that moment and feeling the difficulty of being a journalist, having a job to do, a job that the Klinghoffers wanted done, but also to be a participant. That's part of the grain of the ethical complexity that I think journalists, um, good journalists, are alert to. Um, so I throw that out there as a kind of background and provocation, uh, but also because 
Lisa and Ilsa told you their story, but they have also seen that story told by others. Uh, they've seen the most traumatic episodes in their lives get turned into two TV movies, and you saw excerpts of both in the video at the beginning, and an opera. Uh, in a little while, we'll bring them back on stage uh, to ask them about that part of the experience that they didn't really address, watching their story become something else. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to bring on two uh, creative artists who are on the flip side of that exchange, who have done that with other people's stories. They've transformed other people's experiences into their own creative projects. The composer, Julia Wolf, and I'll repeat that their um, lengthy and illustrious careers are summarized in your programs. I won't do it again now. Trust me, they're both very distinguished people. I will say that the composer, Julia Wolf, won the Pulitzer Prize last year for the piece that you're going to hear a little bit of from called Anthracite Fields. She'll tell us what that's about. But you should know that it's a work that melds historical documents first-person accounts and original texts with her own powerful music to examine a different kind of story from the one we've been talking about this evening. It's about the mining culture and the Pennsylvania community that she knows from her family. Um, Carla Singer is a film and television producer who pioneered the ripped from the headlines TV movie of the week when she was an executive at CBS. So when something would happen, when a news story hit, a promisingly dramatic crime took place, she would get on a plane or get to wherever that thing happened and try to persuade the protagonists, whether it was the victims, the accused, the investigators, to tell her their stories and then in turn to let her tell them to the world on their behalf. So please welcome Julia Wolf and Carla Singer. This is working too. So to my right, I have uh, Julia Wolf and Carla Singer. Julia, we'll start with you. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit of this piece, Anthracite Fields, which, as I said, won the Pulitzer Prize last year. Congratulations for that. And also for the fact that this piece has just come out on CD as of last week. Um, I think you have a few with you, I hope. Um, we're going to hear a short excerpt uh, from a section called Breaker Boys. Uh, what is this piece about, and who are Breaker Boys? I'm going to tell you, but I, I first have to say it's, it's very hard to speak after hearing Elsa and Lisa speak. Um, I have to say that first. I'm sorry. I'm going to try not to cry. No. Uh, I, just being so moved and, and so um, blown away. You know, not, not only by your story, but the story of your mother was just unbelievable. And I'm sorry, I just want, I have to say it because I just can't go on and talk about something else first. Um, it's, it's such an inspiration to all of us. And I think what Justin said about you telling your story and telling it so uh, beautifully it, it is so powerful. And um, we tell stories in other ways, obviously theater, art, and you know, we tell all kinds of stories. And so many people do that in different ways, but directly from from you, from the family, is um, is a gift. So anyway, I just had to start there. Um, also, just wonderful to meet everyone. We actually had a short dinner beforehand, and um, lots of connections to the Lower East Side to you know other <laughs> other connections that are very interesting. So uh, anyway, I'm very honored to to be a part of it. Um, I will try to make this shift now because I know we're talking about um, how to you know art gets created out of um, out of real life stories. So uh, the piece that Justin's referring to is Anthracite Fields, and um, I should probably give a little background on what that is. Um, uh, I got a commission from uh, a choir in Philadelphia, actually very large, uh, it's called Amateur Choir, um, the original people that sang it, um, because for, for their professions, they do other professions, but then they love to sing and they get together. Um, I've been commissioned by many organizations all over the world, um, first time from my home state. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. I'm from Pennsylvania. They're from Pennsylvania. Maybe I should look at this. Um, so I began to think about gr where I grew up in a very small town in Pennsylvania. And um, 
look to that region. And instead of looking uh, south to Philadelphia, which is really where I, the way we usually turned on the highway, because that's where the good restaurants are and the good culture, um, I turned north and started to look at this anthracite coal region, thinking, what, what's up that way? Um, I knew just a little bit about it. So I spent at least uh, a year or two um, going up into that region, interviewing people, hearing their stories, um, and going to the one fabulous little museums that document the life of the miners. Ba basically, the time period is, um, say, late 1800s into the 1950s. The industry basically ended by 1950. Um, but still many people living to, <laughs> what a gift that is, a firsthand um, view of what their life was like and, and all the issues that surround that very interesting and complex industry of mining, coal mining. Um, so this piece is based on that. There are five movements. I won't go through all of them. The movement Justin just mentioned is called Breaker Boys, and um, there was this unfor I guess unfortunate situation uh, where the kids were working in the mines. I mean, there was a lot of child labor before we were all, you know, uh, allowed to go to, to school. So I know everybody wants to have snow days and not go to school now, but <laughs> at that point, those boys really wanted to go to school, and, and that wasn't a possibility for them. So they were um, partly supporting their families, but also... Um, you know, maybe didn't have other options, so they were working in the mines. And this became very, very fascinating to me. I talked to people who had family members who were breaker boys, um, but in particular, actually talking about photography, um, I watched a documentary about the, this great photographer, Lewis Hine, who documented a lot of child laborers in mills and in the mines, and he has a beautiful set of uh, photographs of, of the breaker boys that worked in the mines. Um, so I wound up uh, actually using an excerpt from uh, one of the interviewees of that, of that documentary. Um, cause I, I heard the text and I thought, oh my gosh, this has to be in the piece. It's so moving. Um, I don't think you're going to hear that in this excerpt, um, but the, this movement is a combination of using rhymes that are from the region. So the main rhyme is Mickey picks slate, early and late, that was the poor little breaker boy's fate. A poor simple woman at the breaker still waits to I think it's to meet up her poor little Mickey pick slate. So Mickey does not come out of the mine. Um, and that was a very dark children's rhyme that was circulating. Um, I used other children's rhymes. So you, you hear kind of a, a, a mix of children's rhymes, adaptations of children's rhymes, and what you probably won't get to in this excerpt, though, is the excerpt from the man who was describing what life was like. Um, they sat on a hard plank, their feet bent over, their fingers would be bleeding from picking out the slate. Uh, not a pretty picture for a nine-year-old boy. Um, so anyway, this is, um, I guess we're going to hear it now. A little bit of Breaker Boys. Okay, can we hear that? Mickey Big Slate. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, okay, we're going to turn to Carla. Um, and as I do, um, just wanted to remind you, you should have picked up index cards on your way in. I encourage you to put some, write down some questions on them. Um, raise your hands if you have one. Somebody will come around and collect uh, questions. Um, in a little while, I'm going to invite Lisa and Ilsa back on stage to answer some questions. So if you have questions for them, um, just go ahead and write them down and somebody will, will bring them up to me. Um, so Carla, uh, I, did I describe correctly what your role was in um, turning these stories into art and entertainment and for a mass audience? Almost right. <laughs> when I was at an executive um, at CBS, I was actually in charge of one-hour drama series like Murder, She Wrote and Equalizer. From there, I became an independent producer and, and I specialized in uh, movies of the week. And ripped from the headlines, yes, I was sort of the queen of some of those <laughs> early in my career. Um, but listening to you talk about your mother, I was thinking how interesting it is that you can use the media to get an issue across um, to a very broad audience. And of course, when that movie was done, uh, I was at CBS 1985, my last year there, and it was the first big movie about terrorism, other than I think there had been a hijacked plane some years before. And my specialty in, in movies of the week, um, for most of the movies that I've done, I've done many of them, um, were based on true stories. And so I personally usually chose and do choose ones that have some broader issue at stake. So it's not just a, a story that's ripped from the headlines, but why am I telling the story? And when I get the rights to someone's story, what do I want them to feel that they've accomplished by telling it? And I never like to um, tell a true story unless the person whose story it is understands what they're doing. Um, because they're giving up their rights to me in perpetuity to tell the story. And they have to live with what's on the, on the air. And um, as you saw, your movie was just excerpted here. And it lives beyond, beyond um, the, the immediate you know, uh, airing and, or repeat. So you were pretty accurate. Um, so tell us, we're going to see a clip from um, one of the uh, movies that you made. Could you set that up for us and tell us what we're going to see? So addressing what I've just said, um, the movie that I did was um, one of the early movies on domestic violence and um, you're going to see an excerpt from it. It's an older one but it's one that had a lot of ramifications and, um, and accomplished something in a broader arena. It was brought to me by a, a, a journalist who sat in on the trial of a woman who killed her husband and it was one of the first cases in the country where she used um, self-defense as a battered wife um, and it and, and the woman who, term, who, who created the term battered wife syndrome uh, was an attorney who testified at her trial. Um, the excerpt you're going to see is a little bit harsh, um, but uh, Jacqueline Smith plays a woman named Donna Yaklich who um, was being beat up by her husband who was a cop. And when she went to the police and said, look, my husband's beating me up, of course there was a conspiracy of silence. So it got to a point where he was actually... Um, she felt he was going to kill her, but she couldn't, you know, kill him herself. And so she went down the road and found two um, ne'er-do-wells, gave them $10,000, and they killed him. Uh, I'll tell you the end of the story afterwards, but this excerpt gives you an idea of what she was living through. And um, it's, it's Jacqueline Smith playing Donna, and her husband is um, Brad Johnson, and Hilary Swank, it was her first movie, she plays the teenage daughter. I can't remember if she's in the excerpt or not, but this is it. You know how bad I want to kill you? Yes, I do. Donna Yaklich promised to love, honor, and obey. Ow! I read about the steroids you take for your weightlifting. They've changed you, Dennis. You're not the sweet man I married. You've got to stop taking the drugs. I don't take drugs. I rush people to take drugs. To cleave only unto him. Baby's crying. Don't worry about the baby. It's good for him. Shut up. Ah! I said shut up! It's the steroids. They make him crazy. Who are richer or poor. 
I need you to do something. You got it. In sickness. I want you to kill Dennis for me. And in health. Try and understand about the steroids. It's a deal that you make with yourself. When I use them, I can do things that normal men can't do. <laughs> I'll do it. Till death do us part. No. Here comes some pain. This ain't easy, okay? I've never killed anybody before. I want to die. I just want to die. Oh, I want to die. I just want to die. We'll do the world a favor and pull the trigger. This is my brother, Charlie. All right, he's going to help. Go away. I'm never going away, Donna. I love you. We're just having little marital problems. That's all. <laughs> What about money? How much do you want? I don't know. 40000 I think you're starting to see what marriage is all about. Jacqueline Smith is Donna Yaklich. It is. In a true story of love, abuse, and murder. Victim of rape. So there we have two very different uh, examples of the same phenomenon coming out in two completely different iterations. That is, somebody's story, um, whether it's a collective story or a particular event, getting translated for an audience. Um, I wanted to ask both of you, how present was it in your mind as you were making all of the artistic decisions and creative decisions that went into this, that you were the custodians of somebody else's life or somebody else's experiences? Julia. Well, I was very, very aware of it. Um, first of all, it's interesting also, um, as same with the film, to be covering a story that's um, you know, about, about a very different community from your own community. Um, my, my grandmother actually grew up in Scranton, but um, wasn't a coal miner. So I'm stepping into a situation trying to understand a life, um, a different time period. And it was very important to me to honor the miners. Um, I mean, there are many, many complex issues about coal, you know, including <laughs> the air. Um, but it, and there is an element that addresses that in the piece. But, um, but I really wanted to honor uh, these people who had worked in very dangerous conditions, um, fought very hard for worker safety and compensation, and um, Basically, we are all living in comfort. That was one of the speeches I used. Actually, it was a, a speech made by John L. Lewis, who was the head of the United Mine Workers Union, um, talking to a congressional committee about, again, talking to Congress, um, um, about that we are all living in comfort while they are living in very, working in very dangerous conditions. So these issues were very much on my mind, um, and also wanting to be very sensitive to the people that I interviewed. Um, really listening, you know, really hearing what, what their stories were. Um, it was one wonderful part, I should say, is that they um, came to the performance. I, I, and I, I get, every other day I get a letter from someone who had a father or grandfather who was a minor talking to me about the piece, which is really wonderful for me, a really wonderful connection to uh, a community, um, not just creating a piece about it, but also interfacing with the people. So that was, uh, for me, a very moving part, but, but certainly conscious. Um, the whole way through. And because you weren't telling one particular point of view, how did you distill, when you did these interviews, some things must have been, seemed relevant even as you were uh, conducting the interviews and some didn't. How did you distill sort of this mass of material into a coherent point of view? It's a very, it's a very big subject and of course someone else would have written a very different piece about coal mining than I did. Um, I went in just being open, so as I heard things and read things, um, things would jump out, and, and I would be really um, moved by them. Oh, that has to be in the piece. Not, not everything got in the piece, um, but uh, you know, one example is I interviewed a woman, Barbara Powell, and she, she was actually a, do a docent working in the gift shop, and she said, I, I have a story to tell you, and, and me, me and I'm just in this little historical museum, and we said, great, let's get together, and we put, out, put down a tape recorder, and she had actually documented a lot of her life um, just on her own, written notes about her ex you know, extended family that had worked in the mines. 
But at one moment, she was talking about living in the Patch Town, which is the town that the coal company owns. They, they build the little houses. They, they own the company store, literally. Um, and she didn't feel poor. She said she didn't feel poor, which I thought was interesting because it was a pretty impoverished existence. And at one moment, she said, oh, we all had flowers. And then she started to name all the flowers. And in this fairly dark subject of coal mining, uh, this was a really luminescent moment um, where you know, just the image of the women beautifying their homes with these gardens. And so one movement is simply flowers, and it's just a list of flowers. Um, and that's for Barbara, and she, um, she's very happy to have her movement in the piece. I'm sure she is. Um, Carla, same question. You were telling Donna's story in this particular film. Do you always have a specific point of view that informs what you're doing? I do. This was sort of... Um, an unusual one because the reporter who brought the story to me um, told me that the, there was going to be a, ch uh, a the, the, it was the governor's last term in Colorado, and they would sometimes commute sentences, and he was really sympathetic to Donna, so I took this on in the naive belief that if we made this movie and enough people saw it, enough people got upset, her sentence would be commuted. I was wrong um, because she had killed a cop. And um, it might have been different if she had killed one of you guys. <laughs> but um, I just meant that facetiously. Um, <laughs> so I in this particular one, I felt very attached to her. Um, and I, it, under the Sam Son of Sam laws that I don't know if you know, but you, you, can't, you shouldn't pay somebody who's uh, a criminal any money for their story. So I, 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 she had a son who was still y a young person. and. Her mother was raising her son and her sister. So I bought her story, uh, but I bought her mother's story. And that's how I got money funded to support her child. Um, but I got very, very, very involved in the issue and, um, and tried really hard to get her out of jail. And, and what happened out of this one, which was really interesting, was that for many years, and this movie is, does very, if you watch Lifetime, it airs ad nauseum. But every time it airs, Donna in prison would get hundreds of letters from women who had been victims. And at the very end of the movie, we did put a, um, a, a, a super saying, you know, if, you have, if you're a victim, you can contact somebody. And she would get many, many letters while she was in prison. And I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. But um, she eventually a, a did her college degree while she was in prison. And it snowballed over the years. And um, her husband had... had said that his prior wife died in a fire. And we all suspected that, in fact, she'd been murdered by him. And nobody would believe it, of course, because he was a cop. And because one of the people who watched this movie in repeats a few years later was a detective from Florida, a woman. And Donna was constantly in contact with me. So I, I, in this particular case, I stayed in touch with her. And my daughter wrote her letters. And we, we got involved with, with her on a personal level. And this one detective saw the movie, and she herself had been a victim of violence, and she became obsessed with the story and flew out on her own money to see Donna in jail and then met with me afterwards. And one thing led to another. Over a number of years, you know, Oxygen or one of those um, cable channels did a documentary having seen the movie, and it sort of snowballed. People kept saying, well, maybe he did murder the wife, number one. Maybe it was self-defense. And um, she got 14 years, and the kill two killers who you saw actually got off in three years because conspiracy to kill in this country is a greater crime than the actual killing. <laughs> and um, and he, she was a pretty fabulous woman, and I had just moved to New York in 2001, and one morning my phone rang, and I picked it up. It was like 7 in the morning, and this woman said, Hi, Carla, it's Donna Yakovich. I just want you to know I'm out of jail. I'm in a halfway home. And they eventually let her out because there was so much evidence against it that she got, did an appeal and she got out and she's living a normal life now. She's remarried and um, there's a happy ending to that story, that brutal story. I, it was interesting to hear you say the words, I bought her story. Mm -hmm. um, because you meant it literally. Mm -hmm. um, but it also means that you believed her. Yeah. Would you have made that movie if you hadn't? No. So you were, you were both, it was interesting, you were both specifically 
saw your, see yourselves as advocates for the subject matter in some way, for the people whose story is your. Uh, and, and you both mentioned the reactions that you got afterwards, that were gratified by the fact that people also bought into your stories, bought into mm -hmm. your piece of music, bought into the film. Would you have been disappointed, or were you disappointed, um, by people saying, that's not right, that's not how it was at all? Well, nobody did that yet. <laughs> there, actually, it was interesting because there was, I can't remember if it was on an NPR site, there was someone who was upset. They, they thought maybe I had romanticized the industry. That was interesting. But you know, a lot of times on these blogging, it's the cranky people that write in. I don't know if you've noticed that, you know, in the New York Times. It's kind of the people that complain that tend to. Um, anyway, uh, but it made me think for a minute. I mean, I, I thought, well, actually, he'd missed the point because I did actually address the, the um, you know, the fact of us living in comfort. And I wasn't going to write back and get involved in that dialogue, but um, that's probably the only, con you know, kind of more uh, conflicting response. And for the most part, um, I've just had uh, relatives, I guess surviving relatives um, of, you know, someone's grandfather was a minor, their father was a minor, um, writing and uh, being very interested in the commemoration of this, this world. Um, I mean, it's pretty well documented in, in books, but it, it's, um, maybe not as documented in this way. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you had, in the same way that your, the people who were your subject matter certainly felt that you were their megaphone in a certain way, uh, that you had a kind of amplifying you know, way of, of transforming their story um, into something else and then uh, spreading it, did you both of you feel a, a responsibility to, to do that? I, I, I had a huge platform because broadcast television reaches millions of people. So for me, uh, I didn't get any, the only negative thing that could happen when I do a movie is that nobody watches it. <laughs> and that's if it's you know, programmed against the NFL you know, playoffs, then you're really, you know, you've really you done all this work and no one's seeing it. But I have a very big platform for that and so you feel that you do have power in your voice and that whatever story you're telling, whether it's the story of a young man who uh, you know, falls in love with someone and things happen to them, well then you've got a broad, a broad base for it. And, um, and you, d you don't get the same reactions necessarily that you might get from an opera where people come up and talk to you because I never see my audience. They're out there somewhere. Um, they're you. And um, unless somebody writes a letter or or goes on YouTube or does something like that, I don't really get that reaction. I only get it um, by the number of people who watch. But I know that when I've reached a huge number of people, people are talking about it and it can have a ripple effect. So in order for you to be effective as an advocate for, in this case, for, for Donna, the movie you made had to be really good. Mm -hmm. So did you find yourself with a conflict between what was true and what was good? and have to decide one way or the other. What was, and by good, I mean dramatically um, effective in movie or TV terms. Well, it's an inherently dramatic story, so it's not that difficult to make that a compelling story. Um, but you do juggle things when you're telling true stories of honoring the, um, the truth, and sometimes for dramatic purposes, creating uh, either a scene or a composite character that could help you tell your story that may be a bit of fiction. And um, for instance, I if it says based on a true story, that means it's pretty much a true story, which this was. I had court transcripts, we had interviews, we did an, you know, a lot of articles on it. When they did the Achille Laura, Laurel, I'm th the, the movie of your parents, I guarantee you, it was vetted tremendously on, on networks. You know, there's lawyers going over all of this stuff. So anything you do for, for, um, for creative purposes that may not be actual fact, you also have to be very careful with that. When it says inspired by true events, it's probably not true in terms of the characters, but the events, the plot is true. So Does it have to be inspired? It would be inspired, right. <laughs> something happened and well I have a th creative thought and I'll create something around that plot. So uh, any story that has a point of view also has another point of view out there. Somebody else is telling the same events in a completely different way. And 
seeing what happened with a completely different um, set of values. Um, in, in the case of this crime, I assume that the family of the um, guy who was murdered must have seen th the whole story quite differently. Um, I'm not sure, you know, but there is a coal industry and presumably um, they, they see the conditions under which these um, kids and people are working um, somewhat differently. Um, when you're creating something, do you feel any secondary responsibility to other points of view? Well, I think inevitably everything is subjective in a way. I mean, I'm to, at least in, in the work that I do. Um, that said, I, it was very important to me to be accurate. Um, and by accurate, I just mean factually correct. I wouldn't want to put something in that was wrong. Um, but I, it's, it's a kind of a fine line. I mean, one thing that's important to me also is it's, it's a very intelligent audience out there. So I w also wanted to make this poetic history and um, then the, the audience can put the pieces together. I didn't want to hammer them over the head. Like, this is you know the evil coal industry or something. You know, I, I really wanted to tell this story, reveal these facts about the kids working in the mines, about the labor issues, um, you know, about something about the life, and um, I guess it'd be accurate. But then uh, let the audience see that. That said, of course, if I'm going to put a speech in by John L. Lewis saying that we're supposed to be, um, you know, compensating these families for the situation, obviously I have a. This, I chose that for a reason. I found that very moving. I found it very important. Um, so part of me is going to be coloring, coloring it in that way also. But, but you made sure you weren't going to get any cease and desist letters from the coal industry's lawyers. I haven't gotten one yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. And uh, same question. I mean, do you feel any responsibility to see the story in a way that includes others too? Yes. Um, and it's quite good in a movie to see both points of view because then you have dramatic scenes. So you don't want to just tell one point of view of the story. Um, in stories like this and other movies that I've done, very often I, there's a courtroom scene. So you get both sides of, the, of what actually happened in the, in the courtroom. In this movie, um, there was a scene with the, his, his colleagues in the police force and what they thought, you know, that they thought she should go. She ended up going to jail, so she was convicted. It was trying to defend her. So that was a complicated little dance in that. But yeah, yeah, you usually try to show po other point of view. In the case of the Achille Loro, you weren't going to do any interviews with the terrorists. That would be pointless. But, um, and I don't, rem I, I, I remember seeing the movie at the time, but I don't remember what the balance was. But um, that would be a clear point of view of, of telling the story of the, of the victims in that case. Um, when there is an opposing point of view, to make it a, based on a true story, you do tell both points of view. You know, how you choose to do it is another matter, but yeah. So I would ask uh, Lisa and Elsa to, to come back because I want to ask you about your experiences, and there's some questions from the audience too about the work that was made from your story afterwards. And while they're coming up, I just wanted to ask you whether you had any reactions to a couple of the quotes that I read that suggested that simply the power and balance of exerting a creative force on the raw material of somebody's experiences is inherently, uh, well, is a power imbalance. That it is inherently exploitative in some way. Did that ring true at all? No. <laughs> I mean, for, for me personally, I, I, th I think it certainly can be exploitive. Um, but, um, you know, I don't mean to be naive, but I, I I never think of it that way, personally. I, I think of it um, as some way of capturing a moment or honoring something, as opposed to, um, oh, I've got a really juicy story. Let me see what I can do with it. You know, to me, it's it's um, I'm interested in it. Mm -hmm. So it's, so it comes at least it begins at a very genuine point. What the result is, you know, that's for everyone else to judge. But um, but it, it comes from a very. I wouldn't do something unless I was genuinely uh, fascinated by it and wanting to reveal something. Uh, about it in a poetic way. I'm going to just interrupt for a second, but yes, I did experience the idea of or concept of being exploitive because I did this Pamela Smart movie, TV movie, which was I think the teacher who got her student to kill the parents, and that was a real moral issue for me because how was I going to tell that story and not feel like I was exploiting it? And I had the rights to the parents of the victim, and so we told it from their point of view, 
So it wasn't just about the killer's point of view, and that story's been told a few movies, but really from the parents' point of view, and so we spent a lot of time developing the script and, and the movie to getting in that point of view. You know, these crimes are very glamorous. They hit the newspapers, but there are real victims involved. So you told your stories tonight. Um, after many years of watching other people do it, both through the media, through these TV movies, through the opera, um, in the immediate aftermath, uh, what would it tell us about your experience, especially of the first of the TV movies, which as I understand was something that your mother um, yeah. negotiated? Yeah, well, our mother... Are your microphones on? Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> well, our mother, um, at first she hadn't really thought to do that. She was approached to do a film or... or, or but then she thought, I want to do anything, I, everything I can do to, to, so that the story will be told, so that people won't forget what happened. And so she made a decision and she interviewed some of the people who had uh, expressed a desire to make a film and, and she uh, found a woman who she felt that she could work with that would do it, do, do it well, do it right. And she proceeded to arrange for that. Unfortunately, she passed away. And my sister and I became the, the uh, consultant on, on the first, it was an NBC uh, movie. And what was it like for you to watch that story that had been so much a part of the fabric of your lives turn into TV? Well, we act I actually went to Australia where they were making the film, so, and I met the actors, and they wanted to find out about my parents. They wanted to know how to do it right, how to get it right. They wanted us to be proud of their, their, their art. And so, you know, I met with all the people, and, and they wanted, in fact, here's a story in the second film that was made, uh, Bert Lancaster played our father. Do you know he called us up, he came to New York, because he wanted to learn how my father moved, how did he walk, how did he talk. It was amazing, and he said, I want to get this right. Of course, he then, ha a few years later, had a stroke himself. Uh, so what was the question again? <laughs> Um, did you worry during that time that the story was going to get away from you or that as it became somebody else's project, as it became entertainment, um, something fundamental about it was going to be betrayed? You know, I think our mother was very careful about who she selected and she really spent a lot of time with this particular person who she chose, and we were there listening to the conversation. So, I mean, there's always a little bit of anxiety over it, but we thought from the beginning that we were on the same page, and it was very much that they wanted to honor the story. So I know that the John Adams opera that uh, came s some years later was a really completely different experience for you. You were not um, involved in or consulted um, in the creative process at all. Your first encounter, as I understand it, is when you actually went to see it. Oh. <laughs> no, I, um, I heard that there was going to be an opera, and I thought we would get a call you know, from the people to... To, about it, nobody ever called us or anything. So I said, okay, an opera. Well, at first we were thought, oh my God, how wonderful, an opera. Um, oh, it's going to be wonderful. I mean, oh my God, for posterity, the opera. Th but we never heard from them. So I went, did some detective work, and I, I found that they were in San Francisco. So I got the phone number, and I called out there and left a message on Peter Sellers' a machine. And he did call us back, and he, I said, you know, is, uh, yes, this is Lisa Klinghoffer, and there was this kind of, this had to be the weirdest call I think I've ever had. 
I said, he, like, he said kind of like, why are you calling? Kind of. And I said, well, I'm calling uh, because I thought maybe I could tell you a little bit. You, you know, you'd like to know a little bit about my family, my father. I mean, you're doing an opera. And there was this long pause. And he said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Just like that. I don't think so. I said, you don't think so? <laughs> what do you mean you don't think? <laughs> I said, well, he said, well, I don't need a consultant on this. And I said, well, I don't want to be a consultant. I just, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about them. He said, Lisa, I know you're an artist. You'll understand when you see it. Well, right there, that should have been a key <laughs> that this was going to not work out well. But I still trusted. I guess I was very naive. I, I just kept thinking it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Of course, I. I said to him, you know, if you ever need us, here are numbers. He, they never called, never. Well, as an artist, do you, I'm not asking whether you understood whether you, when you saw it, but do you understand his or the creative team's desire not to have your input, to keep it something quite separate from your reality? <laughs> Is that something that makes sense to you at all when he said that? that he just wouldn't want to know anything about my father. You know, I just, no. <laughs> no, even if he didn't use it, I would think he would just want to write down a few things. I just was really, I'd never been in a situation like that before. So the opera was shown. Um, it then came back into the news uh, last year when it was at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, I know you had a conversation with Peter Gell, the general manager of Metropolitan Opera. Um, what was your feeling about what you wanted to see happen? Did you want the opera to be stopped? I'll chime in here. Um, so actually, we never spoke directly to Peter Gell. Uh, but I think he was getting a lot of pushback when it was announced that it was going to be performed at the Met, and he did some soul searching, and he ended up asking to meet with Abe Boxman at the ADL, um, and Abe told us, I've been asked to meet with Peter Gelb, I don't know what's gonna happen, your thoughts, should I take the meeting? We said absolutely. So it was fascinating though, Abe came to that meeting with a big concern, as we were all concerned about the rise of what was going on in Europe and the anti-Semitism and concern about this adding fuel to the fire. And I think Peter Gelb was very concerned about being adding fuel to that fire. So we were surprised when we learned that he wanted to pull the worldwide viewing of it. He decided to do that. Right. He decided to do that. And we were really surprised. We were we were really pleased. And I should just clarify by that she means that it was being broadcast in movie theaters, oh, a live broadcast Sorry. all over the world, as the Met does for uh, many performances. And in this particular case he decided the general manager decided to pull those broadcasts specifically from Europe or, or right. everywhere outside of the United States, I think. Not in the, it was shown in the United States. No? no? All right. I think it was about 70 countries, and I, I can't remember what? Yes, okay, there you go. And um, so we were really happy about that, and then he went on to also say that he would be in agreement if we wanted to write something to put in the program to talk about what we think and, and what were the facts of the story, which is something that we have been doing every time this opera appeared. We reach out, whether it's in the United States, in another country, and we try to do that. So.
Um, okay. Okay, and then just finally, because we're going to wrap things up. Right. Um, you did you want the uh, did you want the performances at the Met not to go on? It's a free country. I certainly, I didn't want it to go on, but I certainly would never have told him not to, you can't do it. I mean, I, people said that we censored it. I read that in the New York Times. The Klinghoffer sisters censored it, but we didn't censor it. I, we weren't even called by the New York Times to ask our views. They just wrote it one day. They didn't even call to tell us they were going to print this. We opened the paper one day to find out that we had done this. I mean, I don't believe in censorship. I never, we never said, nobody ever said, don't do it. We hope, maybe, we hope they wouldn't, but we knew they would. But you always say about, you're an artist, you get critiqued. Yeah, here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get her going. I'm a they make a good team. No, I'm a painter. I get critiqued. I get reviewed. So they're artists. They get critiqued. They get reviews. So we gave them our critique and our review. Why not? Why shouldn't we? Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for being so patient with us. The reception. I've been asked by my producer to <laughs> remind you that there is a reception after the event, and we'll see you there. Thanks very much. <laughs>